the puffin comes to the mouth of the Bay of Fundy to raise its young. The humpback whale comes to feed on herring that have come to spawn. The North Atlantic right whale and its seven-month-old calf come to nurse. This may be the rarest whale in the world. A marvelous web of life flourishes at the mouth of the Bay of Fundy off Canada's Atlantic coast. Most of the ocean is quite barren, and the survival of nearly all marine life depends on small, food-rich oases like the mouth of the Bay of Fundy. On the surface, these vital oases seem no different from the surrounding ocean, but they have to be unusually fertile to attract animals from all over the Atlantic. The finback whale may have come from wintering grounds off North Carolina. The greater shearwater from nesting colonies off southern Africa. White sided dolphins chase schools of fish in from the open Atlantic, and razor billed auks migrate from the Grand Banks to breed. The abundance of life in the bay depends on the energy of powerful tides. From May to October, this tidal energy works with the light and heat of the sun to form ideal conditions for marine plants, the primary food source of the oceans. Wherever tidal currents create upwellings of water, they push nutrients from the seafloor up into the summer light. This enriched water grows immense blooms of phytoplankton, microscopic plants that form 99% of all plant life in the sea. Phytoplankton turns the water into a murky broth that will feed tiny plant grazers Copepods drift in huge swarms. The flea-sized crustaceans nourish an extraordinary variety of animals. Both the 60-ton right whale and the tiny storm petrel feed almost exclusively on copepods. The shrimp-like krill also eat copepods, and it is krill that draws many animals to the mouth of the bay. Krill sometimes form large slicks at the surface. This can set off a feeding frenzy. Herring attack krill from below, and seabirds dive for both krill and fish. Finback and humpback whales can eat a half ton of krill at one feeding. One hundred meters down, 
krill feed important commercial fish species like pollock and cod. At depths below 20 meters, it's too dark to grow phytoplankton, and the primary food source is plant and animal debris constantly raining down from above. Tidal currents will carry nutrients back to the surface to fertilize phytoplankton, and the cycle of life begins again. To grow just one cod, the bay must produce 30 tons of phytoplankton. Fishermen take 130,000 tons of fish per year out of the bay. Their survival also depends on these fertile oases in the sea. Razor-billed auks and puffins spend most of their lives on the open sea. To raise their young, they must have abundant fish and krill close to their breeding colonies. While raising their young, seabirds are extremely vulnerable to predators, and our ancestors used to eat their eggs and kill the birds for meat. Audubon painted the great auk not long before it was hunted to extinction in the 1840s. He also painted the puffin and the razor-billed auk and speculated that they too might share its fate. About 1850, feathers of every kind became the rage and by 1900, many seabirds, such as the Arctic tern, had been exterminated over much of their range. Only a small number of Arctic terns, puffins, and razor-billed auks still come to the Bay of Fundy. Their one breeding colony in the bay is on Machias Seal Island. The island has long been the focus of boundary disputes between Canada and the U.S., and now wildlife tours quarrel over birdwatching rights. Arctic terns defend their territory by attacking the 25 birdwatches allowed on the island at one time. Terns raise two chicks a year. To feed them, one of the adults is always fishing. If fish are scarce, the terns spend extra time and energy searching for food. As a result, the adults must eat more of the catch, and there is less for the young. This tern chick may fly the greatest distance of any bird, migrating as far south as Antarctica.
although hunters no longer threaten this breeding colony, it is vulnerable to changes in the local food supply. Both puffins and razorbills have only one chick a year. If food is very scarce, a colony will lose most of its young. This happened in Newfoundland in 1981, where about 67,000 puffin chicks, 90% of the total hatch, failed to survive through their first year. Extensive shallows are formed at the mouth of the bay, and the energy of waves, tides, and the sun turn them into undersea gardens. Like phytoplankton, seaweeds are a primary food source of the bay. Seaweeds also provide shelter for breeding animals and protect the young from predators. Juvenile lobsters hide among the rocks and seaweed. Wolffish migrate from deep water to lay their eggs. Pollock come inshore to grow before returning to the open sea. Black guillemots breed along the shoreline and feed on small fish in the shallows. The guillemot lays a tasty egg, and a century ago they were sold as a delicacy on the Boston market. Today, only herring gulls attempt to steal this treat. Swarms of juvenile herring swim to the shallows to graze on phytoplankton. Herring are a staple food for many creatures, including the harbor seal, the least common seal of Canada's Atlantic coast. Harbor seals damage fishing gear and steal the catch, so until recently, there was a $10 bounty for each seal killed. The bounty on harbor seals was removed because the population is considered too small to cause serious damage. As for all marine animals, the seal's effect on human welfare continues to determine its fate. Fishermen harvest the shallows by using an ancient and ingenious maze called a weir to catch herring. When the weir blocks the herring's path, they instinctively follow the straight fence into the heart-shaped corral. Once inside, they follow the curving fence that always leads away from the opening. The net lining the inside of the weir is drawn shut at the bottom, trapping the herring. As the net is hauled in, the herring are forced into an ever smaller space. A vacuum hose pumps the herring into the boats. The 
The herring gull is one of the few seabirds to have increased dramatically in recent decades. The gull is like the rat. It adapts to human activity and has a taste for human leftovers. The tides flow in and out of the salt marsh, circulating nutrient-rich seawater to the plants. Acre for acre, salt marshes are the most fertile areas of the marine environment. Spartina grass is the most abundant marsh plant, yielding two to three times the growth of an equivalent wheat field. Spartina grass is too tough to be eaten until it decomposes. Plant grazers, like the snail, feed on the rotting Spartina. They, in turn, are eaten by predators. Beginning in late July, up to 50,000 shorebirds arrive at the mouth of the bay on their annual migration from the northern breeding grounds. Shorebirds were slaughtered by the millions for food and sport during the last century, and even the tiny sandpipers were shot as they fed on the mud flats. The ruddy turnstone finds a meal by flipping rocks instead of competing for the heavily used mud flats of the marsh. A marine environment can only grow so much food, and each animal has evolved special ways to get its share. When two animals interfere with each other, Competition for food turns into conflict. A humpback whale has chased herring into a weir and can't find its way out. A diver has to be sent down to cut the netting and set the whale free. Local people are curious to see this rare whale, but to the weir's owner, it is a disastrous situation. The season is short, the catch has been poor, and the whale may be scaring off schools of herring worth over $10,000. The weirs have suffered poor catches in recent years because of overfishing by modern herring fleets out in the bay. For many fishermen, the weirs are no longer even worth operating. The whale and the weir are now free of each other, but in the long run, neither can compete with new fishing technologies. Able to catch every herring the bay can produce, Modern fleets were a real threat to many communities and many creatures at the mouth of the bay. In murky waters, 
white-sided dolphins transmit clicking sounds to locate schools of herring. The clicking sounds hit the fish and echo back to the dolphins, revealing the location, speed, and perhaps even the species of their prey. Instead of relying on its ears, the dolphin picks up the clicking sounds through a specially modified lower jaw and forehead. This unique adaptation gives the animal one of the keenest hearing systems in the world. Their exuberant behavior makes humpbacks a star attraction. But most people come here to see one of the rarest whales in the world, the North Atlantic right whale. More than any other, the right whale story exemplifies both past abuses and the present dangers facing all life at the mouth of the bay. By 1100, North Atlantic right whales were being hunted by the Basques off the coast of Spain. Reaching 19 meters in length and a weight of 60 tons, the right whale is slow swimming, rarely sinks when killed, and yields up to 11,000 liters of precious oil. To early whalers, it was the true or right whale to kill. By 1600, the Basques were killing right whales off Labrador. Colonial New England was built on profits from the hunt. By the 1860s, the right whale was so rare that drawings of stranded specimens were made to convince skeptics of the whale's existence. In the 1930s, the hunt was finally banned. But by this time, the right whale had almost vanished from the North Atlantic. In spite of 50 years of protection, Less than 300 North Atlantic right whales survive, and researchers want to know why. Since 1981, the New England Aquarium has been studying the right whales that summer at the mouth of the bay. The researchers have photographed over 100 right whales at the mouth of the bay, each whale can be recognized by the craggy skin patches on its head called callosities. The shape is different for each animal, and they grow only on right whales. The researchers have identified this right whale and named her Fermata. Last winter, she was photographed off Florida with a newborn calf. And after migrating 2,000 kilometers, the pair now arrives at the mouth of the bay in late July. Fermata's calf is affectionately known to the research team as Half Note. At seven months old, the baby is already 29 feet long and weighs about six tons.
Half Note is one of nine new calves sighted this year, and the mouth of the bay appears to be the main summer nursing area for right whales in the North Atlantic. The curious calf plays around the research boat, while the mother makes 15-minute dives to feed on copepods. Whalers used to kill a calf to lure the mother within harpooning distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In spite of 50 years of protection and the birth of healthy young calves like Half Note, the right whale remains an endangered species. The most likely cause of this tragedy is the loss of most right whale feeding and nursing areas along the heavily industrialized coast of the United States. The few remaining areas, like the mouth of the bay, may only be capable of supporting a small population of right whales, so this species may never recover. The right whale's predicament illustrates the greatest danger now facing all marine life, the destruction of the fertile oases in the ocean. Places like the mouth of the Bay of Fundy are the source of both abundance and the extraordinary diversity of life in the sea. <laughs>